Um, welcome everyone to today's version of uh, our international seminar on inverse problems. So we are very happy to have today Bastian Harash from Goethe Institute, uh, which will be talking about uniqueness and convex reformulation for inverse co coefficient problems with finitely many measurements. So thanks a lot, uh, Bastian, for joining us and giving a talk. Well, thank you, Knut and Katja, for, for inviting me here to this very, very nice conference series. I'm very happy to see so many familiar names in the, in the list, and it would really be great to see you in person, but at least we can meet virtually this way. So I'd like to speak about inverse coefficient problems with finitely many measurements and some new results on them. Um, so let me jump right into the probably most famous and most prominent inverse coefficient problem, which is uh, the Calderon problem, or the problem of electrical impedance tomography. So I have a, like one slide practical introduction to electrical impedance tomography. Um, what you see here on the left side, I promise not to tell who this person is, but this is how we take measurements in EIT. We attach electrodes to the outside of a patient, and then we drive electrical currents through these electrodes. And we measure how much voltage we need in order to drive a certain current. And what we then try to reconstruct from these kind of measurements is an image of the interior conductivity distribution. So on the right hand side there, yeah, I can tell what, uh, what patient this is because this, this is myself. So this is a reconstruction from my own lung. And this is well still, still close to the state of the art of the images that you get in electrical impedance tomography. So this is something like a resolution of a 10 times 10 pixel maybe. Um, and you see that this is certainly not good for detecting tumor yet, because if you can detect a tumor in this image on the right hand side and the patient is long dead but it's still already very good for monitoring the lung, the lung of a patient. So if you have a mechanically ventilated patient, you can uh, monitor the lung with this kind of technique. And you see in this very, very rough images, you still see whether some part of the lung doesn't take part in the breathing process. So if water flows into one part of the lung, then you see this already in these kind of images and you can continuously monitor the patient with these techniques. And so this is already practically useful right now. So mathematically, most of you or probably all of you are familiar with the Calderon problem that describes electrical impedance tomography. So the question in the Calderon problem is, can we recover a coefficient in a certain PDE? And this PDE describes the current flux through the patient. So U is the electrical potential inside the patient. Um, so U of X in one point is when you connect this point to, a, uh, to zero voltage, then this is the voltage between this point and the ground level. Gradient of U is the difference of potentials, the infinitesimal difference of potentials. So this is the voltage between two points that are very closely together. Then um, Ohm's law tells us that the voltage times the conductivity gives us the current. So sigma times grad U is the electrical current flux in the, in the patient. And then this equation number one uh, merely is a, uh, is a meaning of conservation of current flux. So the divergence of the current flux is zero, means that inside the patient, the current flux does not get created or destroyed. And then what we can do on the boundary of the patient in a very idealized sense, if you have infinitely many, infinitely small electrodes, we could um, apply all kinds of currents to the patient. So we could control the Neumann boundary values, uh, sigma times the normal derivative of U on the boundary of the patient. And we could measure the resulting potential also on the boundary of the patient. So this would give, give us um, yeah, access to measurements at the form directly Neumann boundary values. And we could measure this for many, many Neumann boundary values. So in principle, we could try to measure all pairs of directly and Neumann boundary values of, for all solutions of this equation number one. And this kind of set of directly and Neumann boundary values, this kind of set of Cauchy boundary values, it's, it's very good to describe this with the so-called Neumann to directly operator and we will heavily make use in the, in the next slides of this Neumann to directly operator. So we say that one measurement that we take from the pa from patient means that we, add, that we insert all kinds of currents through the patient and we may always measure the resulting voltages if we are on the boundary. And if we can do this very, very idealistically, then we would get the operator that maps the Neumann boundary values to the directly boundary values. And this operator is what we can measure with the patient. And um, the, this operator will depend on the conductivity sigma. 
So let me stress here that this lambda of sigma, so the Neumann to directly operator is a linear operator. The directly boundary values depend linearly on the Neumann boundary values. It's a very nice, well posed linear operator. It, can, it maps from L2 space, uh, so L2 functions on the boundary to L2 functions on the boundaries. And you have to factor out constant functions because of the ground level that can be chosen. But this whole Neumann directly operator depends non-linearly on the coefficient of the PDE. So what we can measure is for one sigma, we can measure the whole Neumann directly operator. And what we have to do then is we have to somehow invert this kind of non-linear mapping from the connectivity coefficient to the Neumann to directly operator. And of course, we are probably all aware of all these very important and, and very deep going questions that come with the Calderon problem. So first of all, the question, is it possible? Does all this Neumann directly operator, does it uniquely determine the conductivity coefficients? And let me stress here that in this idealistic mathematical sense that, that we mathematicians usually look at, we have infinitely many unknowns. So sigma is, let's say, an L infinity function, or maybe some kind of smooth function, some Lipschitz continuous function, or something like that. But it comes from an infinite dimensional space. So we are looking for infinitely many unknowns. We also have infinitely many measurements if we use this Neumann to directly operator, because this is an operator between infinite dimensional spaces. So this operator also lives in an infinite dimensional space. So we have infinitely many measurements. And what we try to invert then mathematically is a nonlinear forward mapping from an infinite dimensional space to an infinite dimensional space. It's, it's very important to study uniqueness questions there, of course, and many, many very, very nice things have been done in the last decades on the uniqueness question for the Calderon problem. Um, many, many nice things have been done on the stability questions of this Calderon problem. So in the infinite dimensional sense, this is very, very unstable. This is exponentially ill-posed. But as soon as you start to restrict your solution space, then, then you can even show some stability results, or you can show how ill-posed this kind of thing is. And of course, it's important how to practically do this. So how can we determine this conductivity coefficient from the Neumann directly operator? Do we have some kind of numerical algorithms for them? Do we have convergence results for these algorithms, local or con local convergence results? And what I want to, um, to look at in this talk is what kind of consequences do we have for practical EIT? So what if people really do this in practice? Is there anything that we as mathematicians can, can tell them? Or how can these kind of, of answers that we have for the infinite dimensional problem, what do they tell us about practical EIT with finitely many unknowns and finitely many measurements? So what do people do in practice? Well, they have finitely many measurements and finitely many unknowns, of course. And the well, probably most popular and most natural way of treating this is to say we have some kind of pixel partition for the patient. So we assume that our conductivity distribution is piecewise constant with respect to some known partition. So we just divide the patient into pixels, maybe uniform pixels. Maybe we make them larger in the inside because we believe that the other resolution will be worse. But we have some kind of pixel partition. And what we want to find out is the value of the coefficient on each of the pixels. So this gives us finitely many unknowns. And of course, we also have only finitely many measurements. So um, a good model would take the electrodes into effect. And for this talk, I will just concentrate on a very simple model of finitely many measurements, which means that I say I don't measure the Neumann directly operator on the whole space of L2 functions as boundary currents, but I only have finitely many boundary currents. And I measure the Galerkin projection of the Neumann directly operator to this finite dimensional space of finitely many boundary currents. So then this gives us a matrix approximation to this infinite dimensional Neumann directly operator. And then of course I have a finite dimensional inverse problem. So I'm looking for finitely many unknowns. I'm looking for a vector with n entries where n is the number of pixels. And what I can measure is not an infinite dimensional operator, but what I can measure is a matrix of measurements. So if I have m boundary currents that I can apply, then this means I get an m times n matrix. So one measurement is an m times n matrix, and I'm trying to invert this mapping from Rn to the space of m dimensional matrices. And then, of course, there are many practical questions. It's a just a finite dimensional problem, but the PDE is still there. So this kind of f of sigma, this function, the forward mapping going from the finite dimensional space to the finite dimensional space of matrices, this involves solving a PDE and then going back to uh, the Neumann directly operator, projecting it back to the to this Galerkin projection. So this means for one evaluation of this operator, uh, capital F me, uh, means I have to solve one PDE for many, many Neumann boundary values. 
And then of course, there are many practical questions. So if I have a fixed desired resolution, so of my fixed pixel partition, then the big question of course is how many measurements do I need to uniquely determine my sigma up to this kind of resolution? Um, then of course, the question is, do we have stability or error estimates for noisy data? So if we have some kind of noise in the data, how much effect does the noise have on our reconstruction? We want to have numerical algorithms to actually invert this finite dimensional nonlinear mapping and inverting uh, nonlinear mappings is always complicated. There are some generic methods out there, but you need certain assumptions to get local convergence and you usually don't get more than, than local convergence. But do we have these kind of, of results? So if you use some kind of Newton method or even like Marquardt method or any kind of standard method on that problem, can we guarantee that we really converge against the right solution? And what I will concentrate on in this talk, or what I will do next, is, is concentrate on the problem of local convergence and speak about the fact that this is really a problem of having just local convergence. I want to give you a bold guess, and I will give you some, some complete answers for, for Rubin problem and also some, some first answers or some, some answers also for the, for the EIT problem. So can, let me- Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, so I didn't quite understand, how did you construct that matrix F from which you want to uh, recover sigma? Yeah, so mathematically speaking, this is the this quadratic form, so this linear operator, and then um, this thing is applied to a boundary current and again multiplied by a boundary current and then integrated over the omega. So the physical meaning of this thing is if J is equal to K, then this is the energy that you need in order to keep up a certain boundary current. So this is something that you can actually measure for, for J equals K. And if you can measure it for all boundary currents, also for GJ plus GK and so on, then you can calculate the other entries from that. So this is something that you can physically measure on a patient. And it's also a model for, for more complicated electrode models. So if you have more complicated electrode models, then this gives rise to very, very similar expressions than to this thing. Did that answer your question? Um, so you choose arbitrary uh, currents G1 through GM to do this? Uh, yes, I will give an example right now. Okay. So let me give you an example with, with very, very few. Unknown. So this is a very simple example of EIT with two unknowns. So we have a circular domain and we have in the outside, we have a conductivity of one. Then we have in this middle ring, we have a conductivity of sigma one. In this inner circle, we have a conductivity of sigma two. So this means we have two unknowns, sigma one and sigma two. Then I can, and, and what I measure is uh, for six boundary currents, I measure the Scalarkin projection. So I take as a boundary currents, I hope that answers your questions now. I use trigonometric currents for the simple example. So I use sine, sine phi, cosine phi, sine two phi, phi um, cosine two phi, and sine, uh, sine three phi, and cosine three phi. So this means I have six boundary currents. So I project my infinite dimensional Neumann directly operator. I project that into a six dimensional space. So what I measure is a six times six matrix. And from the six times six matrix, I try to reconstruct the two unknowns, sigma one and sigma two. So I have 36, it looks like 36 measurements, but in fact, it's only three real measurements because for the simple example, the, the matrix will be diagonal. And also um, there's always two diagonal elements will always be the same because of the circular symmetry. So this means there are really three informations and I try to reconstruct two parameters from the three informations. So still, this is formally overdetermined. So I could uh, do that and see, can I, can I reconstruct these two unknowns? And then the natural engineering type approach is, I will just well, try to choose my two parameters so that they best fit to the data. So I minimize in some norm, I minimize F of sigma minus my measurements Y hat. And maybe I add some regularization term or I choose some, some more complicated norm or something like that. But that's basically what people do in practice. They do least square data fitting together with some regularization. So when you do this, then what happens is shown in these kind of images here. So here's this um, two dimensional set of unknowns, sigma one and sigma two. And maybe we start with the right image, but I show on the right image is the residuum functional. So the data fitting functional, how good that is my data fitted if I choose sigma one for some value and sigma two to some value. 
And you can see that there is, there seems to be a global minimizer. So it seems numerically that this problem is really uniquely solvable because for sigma one equals one, uh, one and sigma two equals one, we get, um, we get the best data fitting. And there's no noise added and inverse prime done and all these kinds of things to make this really a, a, very, a very academic example. But you also see that this kind of functional has a many, many local minimizer. So the problem is if you do this in practice, if you minimize this kind of functional, and then, then you usually you, you cannot do global optimization. You can do global optimization in 2D just by plotting or just by sampling many, many points. But even for a 10 times 10 image, we have 100 dimensional unknowns. And in 100 dimensional spaces, you cannot do global minimization anymore. So you, all, so you will resort to something like gradient or Newton type schemes, and they always get stuck in local minimizer. And there can be a lot of these local minimizers, and the local minimizers, they are wrong. But optimization of local minimizers are still useful because they are still better than what you have or give you some kind of good product or something like that. But in inverse problems, local minimizers are useless because they are not the true connectivity. They are not the true image of the patient. And you see in this image that the true minimize, uh, the local minimizers, they can be also far away from the, from the true values. So this means we really have a big problem there. And the engineers tell us that their methods, they sometimes work good, they sometimes work not good. And they also blame that to this problem of, of local minimizers that they, 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 uh, they are afraid that they get stuck in these local minimizers very often. And it seems that, that not much can be done about that because the residuum function is really highly non-convex. There are many local minima. And this is usually the reason why people say that impedance tomography is not just highly ill posed because of this exponentially um, unstable instability, but it's also, it's also said to be highly nonlinear. And what people mean with highly nonlinear is typically this kind of effect that the residuum functions get highly non-convex. You have a lot of local minimizer and you have all these problems connected with that. But let me show you another image. So what I show you on the next slides is this gray zone is the set of all sigma where f of sigma, so my, my measurements, so my data that are my simulated measurements where they are smaller than the actually taken measurements in a matrix sense, in the sense of the so-called Löwner order. So these matrices, they are always symmetric. Um, that comes from the from the ellipticity of the from symmetry of the PDE. So the matrices are always symmetric. So F of sigma is a symmetric matrix, Y hat is a symmetric matrix. And I say that one symmetric matrix is smaller than the other symmetric matrix if the difference is positive semi-definite. So if the difference has only non-negative eigenvalues. So what I plot in this gray set is where F of sigma is smaller than Y hat in this Löwner order of semi-definiteness. And then what you and I plot this for three different true values of the connectivities. So one, one, and three, uh, half, one, and, and uh, three, half, and one, half. And what you see is that the true connectivity value is always taken in the same lower left corner of this gray set. So this means I can, I can plot a blue line with the same slope in every three image. And the, it's the same blue line. And the blue line where it just touches this gray area um, is the true conductivity. And this gray area is convex. We can actually prove this. Um, I will put the theorems later. So this, in, with respect to this Löwner order, this forward operator is actually a convex operator. It doesn't make the residuum function convex, but it's convex between, uh, with respect to this Löwner order. So this means we have a convex set, this gray set, and we have a blue line and pushing this blue line to the, to the edge basically means we do linear minimization. So the blue line, everything that's on this blue line gives you the same value for, for some linear function. And moving this blue line means we, we improve or we, uh, we improve this linear function. So the bold conjecture would be that we can find the true conductivity by minimizing a linear cost function under a convex constraint. Under the convex constraint that we stay in this kind of gray set, we just have to move this blue line like we teach our students in linear optimization um, until it just hits one, one corner of this gray set. Um, and actually we will, and, um, and I, will, I will speak about this conjecture first for a simpler problem where, we, where the results are even stronger and then I will come back to this kind of conjecture for EIT. And if it's, let me just say, if it's true, then this would mean that we can get rid of this local minimization problem. Because if this is true, then this means we have convex optimization problems. And with convex optimization, we can find the global minimizers. And they are usually relatively easy to find with global optimization methods. 
Is it easy to, con to construct these regions here? Um, so for these reason, for these plots here, they are really just plotted point by point. So it's a just 2D. So it's just for every gray point, I, I solve the PDE and check whether f of sigma is smaller than y hat. And so that would be the value of this algorithm because solving, minimizing over these regions is easier than minimizing yeah. that function that you were talking about earlier. Definitely. I mean, when you when you do this for this um, f of sigma, this was a linear function, and this is classical semi-definite optimization. And so this would be a non-linear semi-definite optimization problem, and you have Newton-based methods for that. So we are still at the, at the very beginning of looking at these kind of methods, but we are very, very positive that you can solve these kind of problems like linear cost function under this kind of constraint that you can solve them with very few evaluations of f, so that this can also be um, done in a fast way. But even if not, it would be like, like the first way to, to really guarantee that we get the global minimizer of that. So even if it's slow, it would be a big success, but we are already, we are very confident that you can also do this in a fast way. Okay. So, so let me speak about this conjecture first for a simpler inverse or beam coefficient problem, which is also about how we, how we started looking at this problem. So I'm looking at a simpler version of electrical impedance tomography, um, which is um, motivated, I should say motivated really by, by corrosion detection. So let's say you have a cement pillar like from a bridge and you have some kind of steel rebar, some steel reinforcement inside the cement pillar and you have some corrosion or you're afraid that you have some corrosion on the boundary of this rebar. So then you know where the rebar is, you know the conductivity of the cement, you know the conductivity of the, of the rebar, but you want to know is there some kind of interface between these two sets where something is, is wrong and you want to know how wrong is it. So you do electrical impedance tomography, you apply electric currents, you measure the necessary voltages, and then you try to detect is there something wrong on this kind of inner boundary that we have here. Then a very simple mathematical model is to assume that we just have Laplace equation outside the rebar and inside the rebar, um, that we have a Neumann condition on the outside, it's our applied currents, and that on the, on the interface between the rebar and the cement pillar, that we have no jump in voltage, but we have a jump in the currents that depends on the voltage there with some kind of coefficient that models um, the corrosion on the interface. And then we can pose the same question, can we uh, calculate this kind of Robin coefficient on a known interface inside the domain? Can we calculate this kind of interface coefficient from the Neumann directly operator. And that looks very, very, very similar to, to electrical impedance tomography, but it's actually much simpler. First of all, because we have less unknowns, we only need the sigma on this inner boundary gamma. And also it's, it's somehow so we don't have this kind of interior effect. So physically speaking, we can reach every part of the interface. We can reach from the outer boundary without having to go to other unknown. Part. So every unknown part can somehow be directly reached. But in electrical impedance tomography, we have the outer pixels. And to reach the inner pixels, we have to go through the outer pixels to the inner pixels. It's actually something that, that comes up in the mathematical proofs, where this kind of Rubin problem is much simpler than, than the, than the uh, complete electrical impedance tomography problem. So and what we can prove for this Rubin problem. Well, first of all, we then look, of course, at the same finitely many measurement problem. So we assume that we have a finite desired resolution. So we divide our interface in a couple of parts. So let's say we take four parts. And then we assume that our corrosion is um, piecewise constant. On each part, it's constant. And then we try to reconstruct these four unknowns from our measurements. And we assume that we don't have the whole normal directly operator, but we only have this kind of Galerkin projection, the same that we had to had before and into some finitely finite dimensional spaces. And we also assume, which is often physically makes sense physically, that we know a priori bounds on our corrosion coefficient. So we assume that by some physical considerations, we know how large and how small this thing can get. So we have some a priori bounds, uh, known bounds B and A, and we know that our coefficients are between these two bounds. And then we again have this finite dimensional nonlinear inverse problem to detect our finitely many unknowns from a matrix of measurements, where now the underlying PDE is simpler than it was for the Calderon problem. And what we, think, what we can prove then is the following. We can, first of all, we can prove that we have uniqueness. So we can prove that if we have sufficiently many measurements, so if our Galerkin projection is taken to a sufficiently high dimensional space, then in fact, our measurements uniquely determine this corrosion coefficient 
on the boundary. And of course, if we take a finer partition, if we take a finer resolution, we will also need more measurements. So this is really um, a uniqueness result. If we have a fixed partition, if we have a fixed desired resolution, if we have fixed upper and lower bounds, then there exists a number of measurements so that our measurements uniquely determine the unknown. So we can solve this finite dimensional uniqueness question. And we can prove our bold conjecture for that case. We can prove that our true conductivity or true, our true um, corrosion coefficient is the minimizer of a linear cost functional, a very easy linear cost functional in that, in, in, for that problem. We just have to sum up the value sigma j. Um, so we have a linear cost function and we minimize this linear cost function under the constraints that our um, our sigma is in the space A, is in this in this box A, B, N, so belongs to, uh, obeys the a priori bounds, and that f of sigma is smaller than this y hat. So this means we have proven exactly what I showed you in the image. We have this gray set where f sigma is smaller than y hat, and we have a linear cost functional that we minimize under the constraint that we stay in this gray set. So we have a um, we have a line, we have a diagonal line and that has to be moved as much as possible. And then it just hits the gray, when it starts leaving the gray set, the corner, there is the true conductivity coefficient. So this means our, our solution of the inverse coefficient problem is the minimizer of a convex semi-definite optimization problem. Oh yeah, because we can also prove that the constant set, set is indeed a convex set. So this means that we can solve the problem by convex semi-definite programming. It means that global convergence is actually feasible. And um, in fact, we started out, let me uh, note there, we started out with, with proving uh, the Newton method. That there's, it's actually possible to have the Newton method globally converging for the Scobin problem, but now it's an even more flexible method that can, um, that can give us really global convergence to really find the global minimizer of our problem, the globally right solution. So for this Rubin problem, our results are, are, are really strong, I would say, because we can also characterize how many measurements are sufficient. So, so this result up to now is just saying, well, if we have enough measurements, but of course we want to know if we want to have a certain resolution, how many measurements do we have to take in practice to have this kind of resolution and in order to have this equivalence to the convex optimization problem. And for this Rubin problem, we have an explicit criterion for that. It's a little bit technical, but let me um, try to uh, let me point you to this to this blue expression. I hope you can see my mouse here. So we have an explicit criterion that tells us when the measurements are enough. So the criterion means we have to evaluate a directional derivative of the forward operator. So this f was the finite dimensional forward operator. So f of um, sigma means that we have to solve the PDE for sigma, and then we project the normality operator and the Scalerkin, uh, take the Scalerkin projection. And from this mapping, we can also calculate the derivative. That's relatively simple. Then we have to take the directional derivative at some point in some direction, where we have explicit formulas for the point and for the direction. And what comes out then is a matrix, because f is a matrix valued operator. So this means directional derivatives are matrices. And then if these matrices have a positive eigenvalue, so we look at the directional derivative in certain points in certain directions for finitely many points and finitely many directions. So you can just, just calculate them for computer by solving finitely many PDEs. Then we take, then we have these finitely many matrices. And if all these finitely many matrices have one positive, at least one positive eigenvalue, then our criterion is fulfilled, then we have uniqueness, and then we have the convex reformulation. So this means in practice, we cannot a priori calculate from a resolution, we need 20 currents in order to, to get this kind of resolution. But what we can do is, if we want a certain resolution, we can just increase the number of measurements. And by increasing this number of measurements, we can check this kind of criterion. And we can guarantee that this criterion will be fulfilled at some, if we have enough measurements, this criterion will be fulfilled. So at some point, this criterion will be fulfilled and then we know, now we have enough measurements. So with this, we, we can program the computer in such a way that the computer tells us, now you have enough electrodes in order to detect your unknown with the resolution that you want to have. So that's an explicit, easy to check criterion. And for the simple Robin problem, we can really characterize this achievable resolution with the help of a computer program. You still have to, to evaluate these kind of directional derivatives. But that's finitely many, so there's, there's nothing more involved in that. And we also have, for this Robin problem, we have an error 
bounds. We have stability and, and, and noise estimates. So if this criterion holds, then we have all these kinds of matrices and all these matrices have a positive eigenvalue and then the smallest of this positive eigenvalues, that's something that we can calculate. So that gives us this parameter lambda and this parameter lambda that appears in an error estimate. And let me stress that this is really not just a stability estimate, but an error estimate. So you're probably aware of the difference. If you have a stability estimate, it means if you compare f of sigma with f of tau, then how close are sigma and tau if you know how close f of sigma and f of tau are. Um, but in reality, what you measure is not usually in the range of your nonlinear forward operator. So in reality, what you measure is something that's not in the range of f. So there's usually a step in between with the stability results and the, and the noise estimates or error estimates. And what we have here is really an error estimate. If we measure something that uh, has a distance of delta to the true measurements, um, and if we do this kind of semi-definite optimization problems with the noisy measurements by delta, and we have to regularize this a little bit so that the constraint set is not empty, so I have to, to minimize this kind, uh, we have to, to define the constraint set in such a way, but that's still convex, then we can show that um, there are minimizers, probably not unique or maybe ne not necessarily unique, but there are minimizers of this kind of uh, semi-definite optimization problem, and every minimizer is close to the true solution with this kind of parameters lambda and delta involved. So if delta goes to zero, then these minimizers of the approximated problems tend to the minimizer of the true problem. So this means we really have explicit error estimates where we can even calculate this lambda that's in there. So lambda will become worse and worse if you have more and more unknowns and there's also in inside so that becomes worse and worse. So of course the ill-postness is still there, but if you have a finite number of unknowns, then we have these kind of Lipschitz stability. So these are some, some really nice results for the Rubin problem. Let me say a few words about what, what's, in, what's involved in the proof. So first of all, what we have is uh, monotonicity and convexity with respect to this Löwner order. And that's actually something that we've been using for quite some time now. For it's also the basis of the monotonicity, so-called monotonicity me method. It's, it's, you can formulate the so-called factorization methods, so these are shape detection methods. You can also formulate them in terms of this monotonicity and convexity in terms of the Löwner order. So this kind of matrix-valued operator is really a monotonically decreasing and convex operator if you equip the space of matrices with this kind of Löwner. Order. And that's a very, very general thing that holds for, for very, very general elliptic PDEs and very, very general measurement models. So this kind of monotonicity and convexity that appears in all these elliptic coefficient inverse problems. And the other thing that we need is this kind of control on these directional derivatives that appear. And these directional derivatives, they are connected with um, energies. So these directional derivatives are the energy of some potential and the direction tells you where you evaluate these kind of derivatives. And uh, these kind of derivatives were, were evaluated in, for, in some directions where, where some um, entries were positive and some others are negative. So these kind of directional derivatives, they really compare the energy on some part of the domain with the energy on the other part of the domains. So these, these criterions that we had, they actually tell you that the energy of the potentials that you create with the currents is localized enough on one part of the boundary. And that's the reason why, why we get the uniqueness. Um, at least roughly saying. So if we are able to, to concentrate our energy on one part and we get the coefficient on that part and the other parts don't have so much effect because there is less energy. And that's something that we can, we have, we have a lot of control with so-called localized potentials where we can prove that we can make the energy very large on some part and very small on some other parts. And that's the reason why we can guarantee that these kind of strange um, direction derivatives um, estimates that we need there, they will actually be fulfilled for sufficiently many measurements. And that's also something that we have for many, many elliptic coefficient problems, but it gets more complicated if we don't have the Rubin problem, because then we have these kind of high energy parts and the energy has to travel from the boundary to the high energy part. So for the Rubin problem, you can just make the energy very high on, on any part of the interface and make it very small on, on all the rest. And in EIT, you can make the energy very, very high everywhere inside, but you need a high energy connection between the high energy part and the outer boundary. And you can only make a low energy outside of this connection. So you cannot beam the energy inside the domain, but you have to, yeah, somehow it needs a way to go inside. So we have this kind of going inside from outer pixel to inner pixels that makes things more complicated 
in the case of electrical impedance tomography. So let me go back to this problem of electrical impedance tomography. We have shown from the beam problem that these kind of images that we see there is actually something that we can rigorously prove. On the beam problem, the true conductivity is the lower left corner of such a convex set. We minimize a linear function with just adding up our conductivity values. So for the beam problem, this blue line would simply be like, like really 45 degrees. Um, for the EIT problem, it's not. In this our simple example, this blue line is already not, it's, it, it doesn't work out if I, if I choose it with 45 degrees. And the reason is, or you could conjecture that the reason is that in EIT, this outer pixel and inner pixel, they behave somehow, they are, they are differently important to concentrate on the, in, it's not, it's possible to concentrate energy on the outer pixel, it doesn't concentrate on the inner pixel, but it's not possible to make the energy high in the inner pixel without going through the outer pixel, so then the outer pixel will also have a high energy. So in order to deal with that, you could try to, to differently weight these pixels. So you could say you give the, the outer ring a, a different weight than the inner ring, ring and that would um, correspond to the fact that this blue line doesn't have a 45 degree slope and that this linear function is not simply just adding up the value of sigma, but adding up a weighted sum of these sigma. So then you would uh, minimize a linear function, which is um, C transposed of some vector C times your unknown sigma. So the, so the updated conjecture for EIT would be that we can find um, that there exist these kind of weights so that the true conductivity minimizes this linear cost function with the vector C inside under the constraint, both constraint, and that we are in this gray set where f of sigma is smaller than y hat. And in fact, just Last week, I submitted a paper to, to archive. So very, very recently, I'm happy to, so I'm talking about this for, for maybe half a year now, and I'm always saying, I think I can prove that. And I think that in EIT, it will work like that. And I'm happy that finally the proof is now, now really complete. So, so and I hope it's just submitted, it's not been reviewed yet. Um, so we, we can really prove that um, in EIT, well, first of all, if we take enough measurements, then the EIT forward mapping is, is injective and the derivative is injective. That's not new, we've also already didn't done this um, some time ago, but it also comes out from this proof. And the, the really new thing is we can prove that there exists this vector C so that um, the true solution, the true conductivity is the unique solution of this convex optimization problem. And this vector C, it's an abstract result. We can prove that the C exists, um, but it only depends on the, on the problem setting. So C only depends on the pixel partition and the up glory bounds. So if you have found the, uh, your C for, for one setting with, with um, like one pixel partition and, and these a priori bounds, then you can solve all problems with the C um, for, yeah, well, well, for different persons. You just, uh, uh, only if you change the resolution, you have to recalculate the C. So there is hope of numerically calculating the C, let's say from examples, they do a couple of examples and simulate your data, then you know where the true conductivity is, then you could like graphically, um, you, could, you could see what kind of slopes do work. So there's, there's we, we haven't done that yet and we're really at the very beginning, but there is hope that we can actually, uh, that we will be at least numerically able to calculate the C. And if we can do this, then, then we can really, we have a way of reformulating our Calderon problem with Fairly many unknowns that we can really reformulate this practically as a convex semi definite optimization problem. And that would mean that we could get rid of this problem of local minimizers. And it's also, I think, so for me at least, it was really surprising to, to see this um, because it also gives, I would say, a really new and a nice connection between two different fields with inverse problems and semi definite optimization. I don't know how about you, but I, I knew that semi-definite optimization exists, but I don't know much more than, than that it exists. So I'm basically, I'm, I'm completely ignorant to, to all these methods that there are. So we are just starting to, to actually start reading about how, how do people really solve semi-definite optimization problems? How about reality there and all these things? But this, it's really a big field is semi-definite optimization. Many, many things are known. We don't know them yet, but, but other people know, know a lot about the semi-definite optimization. And I think it's, it's quite, quite interesting Thing that, that these two fields are, have, have this kind of connection, that nonlinear inverse problems really have this connection to, uh, to convex optimization, to convex semi-definite optimization. So with that, it's slowly time to, to finish my talk. So for elliptic coefficient inverse problems, let me, let me sum up. First of all, we have these problems of highly nonlinear problems, which means that if we, if we just 
look at some standard residuum functionals, these squares residuum functionals, or the same applies with, with other norms, they are usually very, very highly non-convex. So this means we usually have a lot of local minima, and in inverse problems, local minima are usually useless, you have to say it this way, because in inverse problem, that's the that's difference between inverse problems and optimization. In optimization, we are happy if you have many optimizers, because we have many ways of optimally doing it. In inverse problems, you are very unhappy, because you, you're, you're looking, you, you need to to find the true solution you need to find the image of the, the true image of the patient because if you find another image that fits nicely to your data but it's not the true patient then this means you treat the patient wrong and maybe he dies because of that so in inverse problems we really need the true solution and not any local minima so, so local minimization local minima problems are really big problem in practical applications of inverse problems there is a possible remedy you can use this kind of monotonicity and convexity with respect to this Löwner order, so we don't have standard convexity, but we have it if we if we equip the measure, if we write the measurements as a matrix. So here's really the, ma the mathematical structure of writing this thing as a normal operator or as a matrix, and then use the, the right mathematical structure for the measurements, then we suddenly have convexity and monotonicity. And we can combine this together with these localized potentials arguments to, to control the energy, which is equivalent to controlling directional derivatives. And from that, it's actually possible to get equivalent convex reformulations of inverse coefficient problems with finitely many measurements. So this means that globally convergent solution algorithms become possible, error estimates become possible. And for the simple Robin problem, they are yeah, it's, it's particularly strong. We can even characterize how much measurements do we need for a certain resolution. And we get really explicit error estimates for noisy data where we can really um, calculate the computer program, the Lipschitz stability constants or the, the, error, uh, estimate, the error constants that appear in our error estimates. So with that, let me finish my talk and thank you for listening. Great, thanks so much for a, for a great talk, uh, Bastian. So that was very, very interesting. Uh, so now the floor is open for, for questions. Uh, please don't you mute yourself and, and ask questions if you, if you have questions. I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, you, you you talked about the construction of these matrices F from measurements of the integral of G I lambda sigma G K. I was wondering how does that actually fit? How do they actually physically measure that those quantities? So so first of all, I mean they are basically a mathematical model that's very closely related to what the to what they can measure. You can measure that by measuring the energy that you need in order to keep up a current. Uh -huh. Because you have two currents involved there, GJ and GK. Yeah. How do they do them simultaneously? Um, well, that's the thing when, when you have these kind of symmetric matrix. And if you know the symmetric matrix, if you know the quadratic form, you can calculate the whole matrix from the quadratic form. So you um, can. So if you know lambda, if you know lambda sig, G lambda sigma G for all G, then you also know G lambda sigma H. Because you can calculate it something like G plus H lambda sigma G plus H minus oh. G minus oh, H lambda sigma G minus H. So from that you could actually measure that. But for okay. here, but, but what they really do is they, they don't do that. They use electrode models. So they measure they they apply a current between two electrodes and they measure the, the necessary voltage between two other electrodes. So usually they have like adjacent, adjacent patterns, it's called. So you, um, you took, take two adjacent electrodes where you, where you drive your currents, take two adjacent electrodes where you measure the voltage, and then this gives you one value. And then you change your, your adjacent electrodes for the, for the currents and for the voltages, and then you write down all these values together in a matrix. And this matrix is almost the same matrix that stands there. So there's a lot of common properties and so so everything we can do with the Galerkin projection we can usually also do for the for the real electrode measurements okay um the other question i had is once uh, when you test like if you have like sigma one through sigma n how do you compute f at that you have to solve a pde numerically right we have to solve a pde let me make some some shameless advertisement to a paper uh, I, was, I was wondering so how costly that is. Yeah. 
So there's a, that's an introductory paper to how to, calc how to implement finite element methods for these inverse problems, because there's a lot of nice things you can do there. So I mean, the naive way would be you, um, you resolve the PDE with many Neumann boundary values, and then you calculate from that the directly boundary values. But there's a lot of things that you can make this in a clever way. Um, and that also gives you with, with no extra computational burden also the derivative at the same price at, at the forward operator. And you can, um, if you want to calculate these kind of integrals in the Galerkin projection, and you do have to do some kind of integration, and you don't have to do all this because you can really calculate this immediately from the stiffness matrix of a, of a finite element count. And we, and we wrote this up in this, in this Jahresbericht to DMV, that's the German Mathematical Society. So that's like a, like a tutorial paper on, how to, on how, to, how to really implement this in a clever way with finite element methods. Okay, interesting. Thank you for the reference. Hi, uh, but a nice, interesting talk. I have a stupid question, like try to get intuitive guess. Is it somehow related to, uh, to eigen, eigen functions, extreme eigen functions of Dirichlet to Neumann map, of discrete, you take discrete Dirichlet to Neumann map, corresponding to your uh, electrode? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a stupid question. And the answer is, I don't know. I don't, I don't see these kind of relations yet. I mean, there are, there's those people in the, in the more, more theoretically oriented analysis community, they look, do a lot of these eigenvalue problems for Laplace and you, you, you probably know this, this famous paper, can you hear the shape of a drum and these things. And it's, it's, I still find it very hard to relate what, what these kind of eigenvalues and directly eigenvalues to what we have here. And uh, I mean, there, there are certainly some kind of connections, but I, but I cannot really make, make use of them or really put my finger. On that. No, sh uh, shape of the drama, it's like again functions of global again function. I'm talking yeah. about again functions of Dirichlet to Neumann map. Okay. Of discrete Dirichlet yeah. to Neumann map. They are not like you cannot hear them, you can see them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this, this doesn't really turn up. I mean, what we have is not the, is always this directional derivative. Because for the, I mean, the Neumann directly operator always has positive eigenvalues. That's always a positive semi, uh, semi definite operator, yeah. positive definite operator. But these directional derivatives, they can also have negative eigenvalues. And, and these are the things that we, we really look at. Or you could say, the, if you if compare to, to Neumann directly operators, then does the difference of the two Neumann directly operators? Right, yeah, system. difference. Yeah, exactly. I would, I would think of it's connected. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I would think of difference, and in fact, um, and in fact, I think this extreme extreme eigenvalues they will also concentrate this uh, potential near. Uh, they also have this concentration. That what? That what? Uh, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah. That was <laughs> basically origin of my. Uh, yeah. Yes, I would say. Yeah. That's, that's definitely correct. Yes, these kind of, of positive eigenvalues that we have of these directional derivatives, if you calculate the, uh, the, the eigenfunction, then this eigenfunction would be a current where the energy concentrates on, on one part of the, of the inner interface. So this is basically a, a current that would almost only depend on one of the unknowns. So you could say mathematically what happens is if you, if you write this in the basis of these kind of eigenfunctions, then the problems becomes somehow diagonally dominant. So, this, so then, then one part of the one unknown is very, very dominant. And that's the reason why, why this, we have this uniqueness that the other parts don't, don't disturb it too much. All right, that's, that's thank you very right. much. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so yeah, actually two questions. The first one is, um, if I have a parametric model for the uh, conductivity of the sigma, say, so what for all kind of parametrization, you can do this, or it's only certain parametrization form, or maybe linear form or something, you can, you have this property. So we need this monotonicity and convexity, and, and that. Um, where well, you can you can um, put functions into each other and monotonicity and convexity of the whole function um, comes from the from the parts that you put 
into each other. So if these if these things fit, so if your if your parameterization is monotonically and convex in the in the right sense, um, then this works. So with piecewise constant, it works. It would work with piecewise polynomials. Um, we are we are thinking about does it work for like an inclusion parameterization, like a shape parameterization, because then it really gets gets complicated. But in some sense, I would I would still expect some monotonicity if you if you make an inclusion larger, then it's like increasing the connectivity everywhere. So we still have monotonicity there. We don't know about convexity if there's some kind of parameterization for shapes that. So that the, the whole operator then would be would be monotonically and convex, but that's basically the, the thing that you need. So the, the parameter to measurements map that must be monotonic and convex, and then you can use this kind of machinery. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the second question is the measurement you use. You do this in a product, uh, but isn't doesn't that lose a lot of information uh, from the pointwise measurement? Yes, of, uh, of course, a lot. I mean, point wise, like, like point wise measurements would be infinitely many information. Yeah. And what we have is, is finitely many values in a, in a matrix. But that's what, what the people in practice have. So they have finitely many electrodes, and then they have these finitely many voltages that they have measured. So somehow you make your purposely make your measurement to be convex and monotone uh, in some sense. Yes. Okay. Um, so the question is, is, is those information you lost, um, you know, maybe for some, something you, maybe, can it create more ill postness or instability um, in some sense? That's, a, that's an interesting question that's very hard to answer mathematically, because if you only have finitely many measurements, I mean, you can only reconstruct finitely many unknowns. So, so as soon as you do this, you, are, you have a finite dimensional problem. And finite dimensional problems, in some sense, are, are never ill post. So mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the ill postness that we usually deal with in, in inverse problems comes from infinite dimensions. And as soon as you're finite dimensional, you for, for many, many problems, you have Lipschitz stability results also, also here. Um, so, so we are, you are Lipschitz stable as soon as you go to this, to this finite dimensional case. But of course, it gets worse and worse when you have more and more. And numerically, in some sense, if you have less measurements, we would expect that the problem is somehow more ill posed. But it's, it's, I wouldn't know how to, how to really put my finger on that. I mean, you could try to calculate the Lipschitz stability constant and see if the Lipschitz stability constants are worse for, for fewer measurements than for, for more measurements. I mean, in that sense, you could try to, to measure the ill postness. And at least for the Rubin problem, we can, we can measure, or we can calculate the Lipschitz stability constant. So for that, you could actually test it, yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, ha I have a question if there's still time. Hi. Uh, Hello? Hello? I can ask? OK. Uh, that was a very nice talk, by the way. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Very interesting uh, ideas. Uh, I wanted to know how you made the very first picture of uh, what looked like uh, a ventilation image. <laughs> but yeah, that's an embarrassing question because what we do here is uh, just one step linear, one step Newton method. So we do um, like NOSA, but but with I think with a different regularization. So we just do one one linearization step on the on the parameter to to data mapping. Okay, and what was the uh, electronics the system that you used? Um, that was this Göttingen system. From, That's the Göttingen uh, system? Okay. Yeah, this kind of early Göttingen prototype. So it's a bit, little bit old picture. It should be around like maybe 2008, 2009. So that was with this um, GOEMF something. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you.
So, so Bastan, I was uh, I was wondering. So you have this uh, this description of uh, robustness with uh, respect to noise uh, with the lambda. Uh, can you somehow you use this to to optimize the parameterization for a certain noise model, say? Yes, um, that would definitely be an interesting thing. So what we are doing there is our PhD student of me who is uh, Andre, who's also in this talk, if you want to talk to him. Um, so he's now implementing these things for, for an electrode model. And then of course it makes sense for an electrode model to, to actually calculate the lambda. And then you can do all kinds of interesting things like how many electrodes, um, how does the lambda improve if you take more electrodes and does the position of the electrodes, can these be optimized in order to get a better lambda? So there's a lot of, of nice things that, that you can do there just by calculating the lambda, yes. Great. So, any any other questions, um, Bastian? Um, otherwise, let's uh, uh, let's thank the speaker again for for an excellent talk, very very nice ideas. Uh, so, thanks a lot to everyone for for coming. Thank you for inviting me.